Hello and welcome to another episode of Casual Friday. I'm here not with the duck, but rather with the neck. Don is busy, he's moving to castle number 86 as the biggest real estate mogul in Germany, or which, whatever he's doing with his life at this point. So I thought, who better to bring on than Trey Domain? And that list was actually quite long, but everyone else was unavailable, so here we have Trey Domain. Uh, before I ask him questions about his um, adventurous trading recently, as always, the show is brought to you by Woo. Link's available in the description below. And with that out of the way, I say that as if it's a bad thing. I mean, they're great. Do actually check them out. But it's neck time. Main, how are you? I think it's your third time on the show, if I'm correct. Um, usually, we I sort of interrogate you to some extent, asking about how is it possible to trade with such absurdly large boxes. There's no way this is anything other than performative. You seem to come out with satisfactory answers, at least for the audience. I won't comment whether I find them satisfactory. And we kind of move on with our lives, and uh, very little has changed since that point. But how are you? How, how's trading been? How's life? Uh, thank you for the warm introduction. <laughs> um, yeah, man, things are good. I, I'm a, I'm an engaged man now. So for all of you guys listening out there, there is hope um, for some of you. Probably not most of you, but for some of you, you can actually speak to women um, and uh, allegedly lock one down. Allegedly, allegedly. To be fair, uh, do you think if you had asked her at the bottom of the bear market, like the second all your FTX money disappeared, she would have said yes? You know what's funny is I met her in Miami in May at like the peak right 2021 so like we're you know going out we're getting bottle service we're spending all this money and then literally like my life and my net worth down only since then basically <laughs> until very recently um but she she stuck with me i, I mean i brought her to dubai and um that is a mistake she, <laughs> yeah yeah and she found I, I mean i found out about ftx basically like with her there um, and our relationship was still very new. So uh, I guess that's how I knew she was uh, a, a ride or die, I guess you could say. is I was like, okay, like, you know, basically saw me lose, uh, you know, lose most of it. And uh, she stuck around. So consider myself very lucky. And I highly recommend uh, you guys go out and talk to some girls. It is, it is good for you. Good for your mental health. Uh, no, it's not. In any case, <laughs> can confirm it's a terrible idea. Um, I wanted to bring up, while we're on this topic of money and profligate spending, uh, there's a very really funny tweet that you posted at the top, basically. Uh, yeah. um, and it's a screenshot of your impulsive shopping. And the two tabs that are open are Zillow, which is a real estate sort of website, and Chrono24 Canada, which is where you were looking to buy uh, perhaps a, an overtly expensive timepiece. And that coincided with the market putting in a high, and it's kind of struggled since then. Now, as I always do, with the benefit of hindsight and holier-than-thou petulance, I just started to barrage your DMs with the normal, you should know better, come on, is this your first rodeo, you know, like, is this your first time trading, that type of stuff. Um, could you sort of talk through what the, you know, how these signals work? Because I think trading systems vary so much, and it's very hard to sort of universalize rules because of how people trade, different approaches, time frames, systems, and so on and so forth. But there's just really something grounding in the whole idea of if you're, regardless of your trading system or time frame or instrument or market, whatever, if you feel comfortable like either flexing your PL or calculating your future PL or like showing your trades to your friends, that type of stuff, it seems almost like as close as we can get to a law of nature of trading, that when you do that, you're at least in the danger zone, if not outright. Uh, top signal is is that your experience as well? I mean, it isn't on this occasion, <laughs> but I mean more broadly. I mean, it, it is scary accurate how how this works. At least for me, um, you can go find a tweet from me, April fourteenth, two thousand and twenty one. That is the day the market topped. And I bought a Rolex and I tweeted a picture of it. I hadn't even received the watch yet, but <laughs> I bought it from sent me a picture of the watch that I had just purchased. Oh, God. And um, it was to the day. I think it was April 12th or April 14th. Like we're talking like the Pico, Pico, Smiko top. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, something I, and I say this all the time to, to people. Yeah, it's, it's literally the daily candle the top that is impressive like that's impressive um 
you have to realize like no matter how long at least for me no matter how long i've been doing this i still make some of the most amateur errors in judgment with regard to taking profit when i'm feeling euphoric um you know fomo trading um kind of things that you think where it's like okay when you're learning how to trade okay don't revenge trade you know, oh, you're taking a screenshot of your PL, it's time to take profit. It's like, okay, these are like beginner. I still make these mistakes today. I've been trading, I mean, I've been on Twitter since 2014. I've been trading well, I would say, for at least five years. Um, so it happens. Um, so I, I think the human element of of trading is the hardest one to kind of wrangle and manage. And I am absolutely jealous of someone like Don who is like a robot um you know like it's just that binary for him oh this level buy like this level sell and close the screen don't look at it again until three weeks later when it you know ends up being the pico bottom that he bought and it's up 3x um so uh, that's something that I still struggle with and so if you're someone who's new and you're you're feeling these emotions and stuff like it doesn't necessarily go away uh, I think you just get better at identifying them and managing them. But I mean, the worst part of this instance for me was I was so dialed in in terms of doing all the right things leading up to it. And then like on the last day, I kind of faltered. Uh, and uh, I mean, yeah, man, that's human emotion. That's greed. It's it's really, really, really uh, obvious in hindsight. But in the moment, you know. In the moment you're, like, you're maybe just browsing, I do need a watch. <laughs> you're like yeah, maybe, sort from most expensive to least expensive. Type yeah, food. it's like my budget <laughs> just doubled. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair enough. I, I, I do want to ask you about that rotation, but also you just went way too lecture mode, so I have to go even more casual. Sorry. Uh, why the fuck do you tweet so much about Capo? Uh, you seem to have, I mean, crypto Twitter in general has like a fixation on him, and even on this show, we had like a 15 minute segment just because it was quite entertaining um discussing some of his mannerisms and it wasn't even like roasting the guy or anything it was just laughing at the stuff like to, to all of you who've been respectfully bullish you know like that language of uh, to those of you who are respectful to the other side yeah. um like that just tickled me in a very <laughs> particular way uh, but you seem to almost uh, chronicle you're like the capo chronicler to some extent you're in his I'm telegram the inverse, i'm the inverse <laughs> bruh of of Kappa. It, fe it feels that way. Uh, he he seems to occupy a very uh, special place in your mind. W what is it about him that captivates you? And do you have any well, comments about the Capo phenomenon in general? Well, what I think is funny is people think it's below me, and I'm like, do you not know who I am by now? Like nothing is below me. <laughs> can confirm, yes. <laughs> yeah, this is absolutely not below me. Um, because I, to me, it's there's like it's it's the arrogance of it. You know what I mean? And there's a little bit of like, absolutely me being just a petty, jealous person being like, this guy sucks <laughs> and he gets more likes than me. That is 100% part of it. Well, it's like 95% uh, probably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is, that is a large part of it is jealousy. And I, as you and I discuss all the time, I have a sickness. Um, I need to be liked even by people that I shouldn't care about their opinion. <laughs> but um, <laughs> that that's, that's definitely 95% of it. The other 5% um, is, one, I do think it's hilarious um, that you can be this raw. I mean, I don't know if you remember Ash Drake from 2017. That might have been kind of right when you were getting on Twitter. Oh, yeah. But, even before that but, was his historical stuff, right? Wait yeah, for the bounce like, and short the corn. Yeah, this was like the original Capo. Um, he was like just unbelievably relentlessly bearish through the entire, you know, bull run. Um, so I don't know. There's like a fascin a fascination of it. Maybe I'm just not creative enough to have my own content and thoughts and I just need to farm other people's <laughs> shit for engagement. Yes. I, I mean, I think I need to be studied. Um, <laughs> I think probably in some sort of institution. Yeah, post mortem um, for sure, though. Like, yeah. <laughs> send my brain in along with the guy who held fucking dog with hat or bonk, whatever it was, to 10 mil. Me and him, after death, our brains are going to the same place. 
Yeah, we'll, we'll make some discoveries for sure. But you do have a sickness. There, there is something profoundly wrong with you. Like, you know, you could have some, you could post a bit of content and you'd have a hundred comments saying how helpful it was and it was funny and entertaining and otherwise valuable. And then one Twitter egg, uh, shout out if you know that reference, would be yes. like, hey, I'm not sure this was your best piece of content. It doesn't even have to be malicious, right? It's like anything other than pure adulation uh, will just send you reeling. So I'm not saying if you're listening to this now, you should leave like a semi- critical but kind of neutral yet s s subtly scathing comment to main to torture him for the nights to come but maybe you should consider that just typing something yes. in that comment box as as I, we're having I this will, discussion i will lose sleep <laughs> he will it's, over it it's there's no hyperbole here whatsoever like anything that's not just adoration this this guy yeah that there's there's something really wrong with you surely that no, affects it... your personal life and like your choices with women to some extent are you like a love bomber are you someone who isn't receptive when you don't get love bombed because like hey why aren't you love bombing me i'm like the best thing ever does that sort of carry over also we will get to the training stuff i promise but god help us it's casual friday and my duck isn't here so <laughs> we're gonna veer a little bit yeah you know what it's it, it's i mean we're all sick if we're on crypto twitter i think in one way or another um i, I just think it's like i'm not someone who I think handles negative criticism well at all in real life. Like this is something I know from school, growing up, you know, class projects, comments from teachers. Like I just, I didn't, I'm not, I don't accept constructive criticism well at all uh, or any form of criticism whatsoever. Do I blame my mother for saying I'm a special guy and I'm the best? Probably. It's probably partly her fault. <laughs> Um, and, uh, yeah, then you add in 400,000, uh, strangers on the internet who can say whatever they want about you. It is an interesting, uh, mix to say the least. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I think I've gotten better. I used to, if you remember, I used to com I used to respond to everyone. <laughs> Dude, it used like, to be so bad. <laughs> I used to respond to someone who had no followers, egg profile picture. No, you would like, would quote, like, retweet them. Yeah, like... They'd be like, wrong. <laughs> And I'd be like, oh, I'm wrong. Like, and I would just, it would be insane. So, um, you know, maybe that's why I'm bald. I don't know. It must be related. Uh, could be genetics. Could be the just unnecessary stress I put myself through. Self-inflicted uh, completely. Every day just existing on the internet. <laughs> and then I started showing my face and that's opened up a whole new can of AI generated face swaps. Yes. And neck yes. Memes. Well, it's whatever room is left by your neck for your face. To be, yes. to be precise. Um, I do want to reward at least somewhat the people who have been here for the trading element of it. They've probably all fallen off by now. So if you've made it this far, congratulations. I wanted to kind of almost zoom out as far as trading philosophy goes and sort of ask you a question to ground your beliefs because you belong to an interesting tradition of like within trading or a subculture. And whether you want to call it ICT trading or smart money concepts or some variation of that, um, you, you sort of identify with that to some extent. I guess let's get that out of the way, right? I'm not making stuff up here. Yeah, I mean, you guys are neophytes, okay? <laughs> yeah, that's true. You, you, okay. You neophytes. I walk in the footsteps of the elephants in the room. Yeah, so basically you've left Plato's cave, right? And then yes. you're sort of enlightened in that way, and the rest of us are um, fumbling through. Now, it's interesting. If, if you look at sort of smart money concepts or ICT traders or whatever, in my experience, they fall somewhere on a spectrum. It's not the spectrum that you're thinking. That's, that's probably related as well. Uh, the yes. specific spectrum I have in mind is uh, if... You, if, if we sort of pan out what the extremes look like, on one extreme, you'll have those who are sort of super cynical and purely extract the utility out of it. So it's like, yes, there is no interbank price delivery algorithm and price isn't delivered or super manipulated. This is just a lens through which to view price action and market structure. Uh, and it gives some grounding of uh, a system and patterns which are identifiable enough in real time and replicable enough in real time often enough to where you can trade them and maybe make some money or they'll sequel or over enough time or through your own experience, so on and so forth. That's, let's say, the soft version of, of that school, if you yes. will. And then the hard version is obviously if you, you, go to, you go to quite some extremes and it's essentially, I, I would say, there's no such thing as a market right? Like what you're seeing isn't the sort of free exchange of buyers and sellers uh, on the open market, but rather the, the price changes that you see in an instrument 
are by a majority or almost entirely engineered by a single centralizing entity or algorithm. Uh, and you're essentially Nicolas Cage in this analogy, where you're sort of tracking it down, seeing its footprints and um, trading with this, I guess, sacred knowledge as to how these markets are being priced by something else. So you, you kind of have to abandon the idea of what a market is entirely and have to assume a completely different set of assumptions that this isn't like a, a standard market like you would envision it, but rather prices explicitly controlled by one single centralizing entity. You can identify how that single centralizing entity uh, by and large operates and trade according to these, I guess, laws of its code, right? Or laws of nature equivalent in the market. Um, where do you fall between those two? And also, do you think that's an accurate characterization or am I being um, slanderous and, you know, unfair here? Uh, it's called Enigma and Ibida. And if you don't know what those <laughs> things mean, uh, why are you even here? Um, listen, so it's, it's, it's actually hilarious because I've been working on this um, long-awaited um, and massively overhyped video that I'm finally going to release on market structure. And I was recording it yesterday, and I'm refreshing myself on ICT type of market structure and how he does it. And I'm just like, God damn it, this is confusing. Like, how how is anyone supposed to understand what the hell half of this stuff is? Um, I initially was very deep in the Kool-Aid. Um, I had ICT on for an interview on my YouTube channel. Um, anytime I would tweet out anything about order blocks or breakers, I would like credit. I learned this from ICT because he used to go after people being like, I invented this. And if you say otherwise, like, you know, fuck you basically. Um, so I used to be full on death cult, you know, Kool-Aid drinking, ready to follow him, you know, in drink the Kool-Aid and go to the spaceship. That's going to take us to the, you know, to the great beyond. I used to be all the way. Right. Um, but then I started noticing that if there's this algorithm that controls the market and, you know, supply and demand doesn't matter, right? It price is not going up because there's more buyers than sellers. You know what I mean? Like that's that, it, but it just so happens that all of the, the algorithm adheres to these kind of basic market tenants. It's like, well, price goes there because the market, the algorithm is seeking liquidity. It's like, but isn't that like because there's buyers and sellers and there's potentially buyers or sellers at that point on the chart? It's like, no, it's the algorithm. Um, you know, price moves during the kill zone. The algorithm's coded to do that. I was like, oh, you mean 30 minutes before New York opens? <laughs> like when, 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 when America gets online, it happens to be volatile. Oh, the London kill zone. Oh, when Europe gets online, right. it happens to be volatile. And I just kind of started to, you know, you come out of the the cloud and you look back and you say, okay, like according to the super deep ICT people, none of this stuff matters and exists. It's all driven by the algo, but we're going to use all of the things that a person who doesn't believe in the algo uses. And it just happens to work very similarly, just slightly different with different obtuse names for things um so i've moved way to the other side of the ict curve i still credit him with a lot of my learning and the concepts i use i learned from him um i use their names for sure uh, but my strategy is very simple and it's very basic um i would consider myself more of a price action trader than just an ict trader even anymore these days um, and I was doing this market structure video and I kind of was like, you know, it's just overly, is this the right, is pedantic the right word to use here? I know you like the word. It's, it's, it's possible. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just overly verbose to explain anything when I'm like, okay, really it's a high and a low. And you know, this is where the move is generated. Do you want to call it one of these eight types of order blocks? Or do we just want to mark the area off and say, Hey, I might be a buyer down here. Um, so the, the deep, the longer I've been doing this, the, the, I guess the Kool-Aid has worn off, um, significantly. Um, <laughs> it's also gotten unbelievable how much it's grown on Twitter. I mean, Not it's as more much popular Twitter, than ever, right? But ICT has got a million subs on YouTube. Amazing. 
That's a lot. Like his videos do numbers. And whether crypto tw- Twitter people like to, you know, there's a lot of crypto Twitter guys who are marking order blocks. They're calling them more order blocks. They're calling them fair value gaps. They're calling them breakers. Uh, whether or not that's influenced by this new uprising of people finding ICT or not, um, his footprints within the fin- FinTwit sphere are very apparent. Um, but I just think anytime anyone takes something to like a cult-like level, where it's like, this is the only way to do it. Some of the guys who make the most money that I talk to, um, if you tried to explain ICT stuff to them, they'd be like, are you like insane? Like, what is this? Like, I'm just bu-. like, look at Don. Like, Don just buys levels and outperforms 99% of the people on the internet. I have friends who just only log stuff when the market is just going up. They don't even use levels. They just draw like a trend line. And as soon as it breaks, they just long. So, uh, there's a lot of ways to skin the cat. Um, I think ICT is a phenomenal marketer, possibly one of the greatest ever, because uh, he's basically been selling and repackaging the same stuff for 15 years now, successfully. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, I think that's pretty accurate. Uh, do you think there's any benefit or anything you might miss out if you don't essentially go, because you sort of went all in and then sort of crawled out, right? Um, do you think there's a benefit in if you're trying to learn a system or study it, just becoming a cultist and then seeing if there's a way out? You know, if you, if you take this very cynical approach, the yeah, yeah, okay, the pontification about market microstructure is just complete, uh, completely erroneous and the, the algo stuff is nonsense. But maybe there are a few insights here. Like if you approach it cynically, could you be missing out on things that only become apparent if you go all in? Are there, are there benefits to this kind of ideological full submission to something when you're studying it? Um, I mean, maybe I just think that like, if you watch any of his content, um, you're going to know very quickly whether or not this is something you can sit through, um, and, and, and gain any value from, cause it is not easy. You know, it's not an easy watch. It's quite a painful watch. Like he rants like no other, uh, and he will take two hours to get to a point of something that can be explained in 20 minutes. Um, I think if you're a brand new trader, I, there he has a series called the 2022 Mentorship that he's released on YouTube. That is an entire trading system, and it's relatively compact. I think it's like 12 videos. Um, maybe it's more than that, but like it's 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 an entire system from start to finish. Um, I think that's probably one of his best pieces of work. You see everyone using it on kind of Forex Twitter. They're using the, it's like some sort of Judas swing SFP model in the morning. Um, But it works. It is a system that works. Uh, But I I think you are going to spin your tires if you try and consume all the stuff he has out there. Because what you're going to realize very quickly is the stuff he taught in 2011, 2012, 2013. He taught it again in 2016. Just he renamed everything. And they taught it again in 2022. But again, renamed everything. Um, So, yeah, I I think there's better ways to go about it. And I definitely think I... I don't know if wasted time is the right word with some of it, but a lot of it was unnecessary because the stuff that I use is very basic and stuff that you can learn watching your lectures for free. Yeah, a, a funny way to look at it might be if you want to look at the price action stuff, look at that course and then go to Adam's blog to learn how markets actually work from a market microstructure point of view. Um, yeah, that, that, that's sort of an entertaining resolution there. I'm also generally a believer in the I, I don't really like really sort of wide principles or slogans with broad application. But one of those, you know, the basic one of if you can't explain something simply, then you don't know it that well, or maybe it's nonsense, that type of language. I'm inclined to believe that that's applicable. And also in general, and you and I have witnessed a lot of crypto Twitter traders switch systems sort of six times in just as many years. And, and that's a very sort of common phenomenon. And I think it's just worth making the intellectual distinction between identifying a sort of tradable market effect and then also identifying the cause of that tradable market effect. Those are two very different things, right? So you can borrow a setup from someone and say, you know, when, when this kind of thing happens, this 
kind of tends to be the outcome. Uh, and, and you can say that with whatever degree of certainty is warranted. But it's a completely different claim to then say, because I've, uh, I, I can identify this market effect, I then know what, what the cause of that market effect is. They're not part and parcel together. Like, you know, if the market does like whatever, some of the stuff you trade, like a, I don't know, like a breaker or an SFP or whatever, um, you, you can identify it and trade it in real time. That has nothing to say that you know what's actually going on on the microstructure level uh, when those uh, formations occur, right? You're just, you're just trading a, an identifiable construction that you're arbitrarily looking at from a candlestick chart point of view. There could be 10,000 other traders who are looking at a footprint and they see the exact same construction and maybe have a slightly better understanding of the market structure sort of dynamics and they trade the same thing. So arguably you're trading the same setup, but your understanding of the causes as to why it works are, are, are completely different. Um, and to be honest, I think the 100%. cause side is more often than not, especially if you're like more technical or price action oriented, it's kind of overrated. Like I, I think at most, like if you read Adam's blog on market microstructure and sort of uh, just understanding how Delta works and passive versus active order flow at most to kind of get a rough idea, uh, that'll probably serve you most of the way there if you want to trade price action. Uh, that is actually a question I had on my the list in my head. Um, do you look at, I mean, your approach has been very consistent in terms of, I guess, the uh, underlying <laughs> mechanisms and uh, the foundation of it. Um, but obviously, crypto Twitter has changed a lot in terms of what people look at now. Like when when we started tweeting and stuff, like all this stuff about like funding and futures and basis and open interest, uh, CVD footprint basically didn't exist. I mean, it obviously did, but it wasn't anywhere near popular and it wasn't the standard go-to by any means it was all just like trend lines and chart patterns and even i used to get trolled on crypto twitter in 2017 for drawing horizontal levels on charts oh, yeah. because they were so unusual and everyone was trading triangles and diagonals and stuff so as as the twitter meta has involved to some extent and i guess the, the tools that people use on average to look at flows to look at futures and kind of get a deeper look uh, have you found yourself carried by that tide at all or are you still very much like here's my box and go fuck yourself yeah, I mean, no, here's my box and go fuck yourself. But I've even made it simpler. Um, like my strategy is one chart pattern that I just look for and it repeats over and over and over again. And I think we went quite into detail on it on one of these previous videos. Uh, one of the videos that did quite well about, you know, like kind of my strategy. And it just it just works for me because it's 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 like even though I can fuck it up by, you know, going on Chrono 24 and Zillow when uh, my trade idea is, you know, playing out and I'm doing something stupid in terms of the mechanical aspects of it, it's it's like brain dead. And that's what I I like about it. Um, I don't consider myself smart enough um, to understand half the stuff a guy like, you know, Abe Trade is posting or 52 skew, um, you know, when they're posting about the looking at the book and where the bids are and are there trap sellers and buyers and looking at all this stuff um or there's the fugazi people who are looking at the what's that the high blocks liquidation oh levels. god yeah not uh, this rabbit hole. <laughs> for me it's like look at like you can look at ethereum right now and it's like okay it ran a low which everyone thought it was going to break down from and now if it reclaims the level i have a very easy long setup with a very clear invalidation um, and I'll find that setup form all over crypto, all over equities, all over FX all the time. So um, for me, it's simplicity that scales, um, at least for me. Um, I think it's also important that you get the reps in with whatever you're trying to do. Um, you know, I make money doing this. And uh, why would I why would I change it where we kind of talked about that earlier, right? We used to have that very much flavor of the month mentality in crypto Twitter where it was Ichimoku clouds and then it was price action. And then everyone was using the heat map and order flow. And it's like, you know, unless you, I always liken it to sports. Like if you take 10,000, you know, penalty kicks with your right foot and then it's game time and you decide to go with your left foot, like what are the odds like that? It doesn't work as well. Um, so to me, it's it's repetition. If you find something that works, stick with that, refine that edge to hell, as opposed to being like, okay, maybe I'm going to add something else that's going to change it, and, you know, slightly improve my hit rate or whatever. Um, if you've got something that works, uh, I would say hone in on it and, and focus on it and master it. Yeah, I think that's very sensible. Um, and also, you know, rather than looking for additional setups, 
you could always just make your single setup better and then you could risk more on it. And so in terms of the impact on your PL curve or lifetime equity, it could be just as good, if not better, than adding another setup. Just you're more familiar and you probably know the risks better. And the impact is the same rather than saying, okay, I've got something that works. I don't really need to refine it. It works well enough. And now I'm going to go uh, look for, you know, journey into the unknown to look for other stuff. You can just take that one thing. You'd be surprised by how much you could refine a single setup and, you know, apply it to different market conditions, apply it to different markets, apply it to different time frames. have indicators that tell you whether to size up or size down, when to cut it early, when to hold it past your target. Those are all sort of in enhancements that you can add to a single setup as opposed to getting something that sort of roughly makes money and then journeying out to look for additional I mean it's a lot harder to find something like a new edge essentially and a new setup than it is to make something that works better I think um, yeah just scale the account right like that's that's going to be what grows and your confidence in scaling your size is going to be a lot stronger if you are doing something that you were doing before and that you know it works and you have the data to back it up um it, it it's the best way so no completely agree and what has, has anything changed since we last spoke broadly speaking in terms of your trading system because if i recall correctly it was essentially sort of a how would i describe it, it it's almost fractal based to some extent using a, it's particular, a deviation bro <laughs> it's a deviation bro uh, it's sort of fractal based in a very specific sense right where you'll have like two to four um chart pattern price patterns that you like um, and they scale based on time frames. And so you identify a general area where you want to do business. And then you'll look on lower time frames for those two to four constructions to come to fruition. And if they do, you punt. If they don't, you don't. And that's that was sort of the core of it, if I recall correctly. Has, has anything changed? Yeah. Have there been any sort of big discoveries uh, as you've been applying this system since we last spoke? Well, so you start with the big boing box, right? That's the biggest Step one, number one on, on the, yeah, on the yearly like, chart yeah. that's integral to the system it's the <laughs> yeah. huge fucking boing box that you takes up the whole screen once you're down to the hourly apparently yes. um to, to be honest with you so this goes back to the kind of ict being too confusing thing um when you're trading an ict or a price action system generally they want you to know he'll call it order flow right which is not actual order flow it's like are we bullish or bearish right are we in an or are we in a downtrend so you start with your order flow, and then you need to figure out your drawn liquidity. So what is the next most likely place that price is going to trade? Is it going to trade to you know, a high or a low? What is that high? Is it last week's high? Is it some, you know, a monthly level? Whatever. And then you have to have your you know, entry pattern. Is it a breaker block? Are you entering on a fair value gap? Are you entering on? And it's like all these complex things that you got to try and mold together. So what I've done is basically simplify it by starting on the H12. I will mark the most recent high and low. And I'm not using any sort of crazy way to determine market structure. If we're in an uptrend, I look for the low that generated the most recent swing high. I'm now looking to long that pullback. And my strategy is as simple as, okay, if we're pulling back on the H12, I want to find where I think that pullback is going to stop. Generally, it's you know in an area of demand, an order block, whatever the fuck you want to call it. People will be like, well, how do you know to use the breaker or the fair value gap? I'm like, mark all of them on your chart. You're going to notice it's all the same fucking level. It's all the same level almost every time. So you mark it out. And then those chart constructions that you're talking about on the H1 or the lower time frame, all I'm really looking for is the low time frame to give me a clue that it is now going to start going up again. Because if I believe the H12 is going to make a higher low, the lower time frame is probably in a downtrend going into that zone. And then I basically am trying to time when it goes into an uptrend again. Um, it's really that that simple. Um, and uh, you'll s all those drawn liquidities, order flow, all that bullshit, it gets answered for you where I'm looking for a higher low here. Fantastic. Where am I targeting? I'm targeting, you know, continuation of the H12 tra trend. So that previous H12 high, that is your range high. Um, so it hasn't really changed. Um, I think I've just continued to simplify it. I mean, I think since we last spoke, I joined the Haven. So I've been in the Haven since. Um, may 
And I've done streams for years. I've had I've, my first stream was in 2018. It's been five years. I have 700 YouTube videos. Um, so I've always kind of educated, and I use that word very loosely um, on my stream. <laughs> yeah, but like enough. on the fly, right? Like I'm marking up the charts. People will ask questions, and I'm very good at explaining what I'm doing while I'm doing it. And humble but too. What I, yes, of course. <laughs> um, but what I'm not very good at is. Um, explaining something in a very structured concise way where someone's like okay like make it uh, a course is the wrong term but like hey can you make a video just explaining your system and it's like over my 600 videos i have people who have learned my system just from watching my streams but there's no one video where i can say hey i teach it from top to bottom in this video so it was a bit of an exercise for me in the haven to say okay how can i simplify this and explain it in a way um, that people can understand um, from varying, varying levels of skill. I wanted this to be a system that is a kind of intro to price action that people can expand on. So it's a mechanical system. It's not the exact way that I trade every single time, but this is a very easy rule-based system that requires very little subjectivity. You have a checklist of things that you look for. Um, so I think that's what I've done since we've last spoken is I've, I found a way to kind of simplify it, make it almost as mechanical as humanly possible. There's always a human element, of course. Um, and then learn how to teach that to people in a, a concise way. Uh, uh, and, um, but yeah, it's, it's not very complicated. The hard stuff is Chrono 24 and, and Zillow. <laughs> Zillow. That yeah. stuff I can't teach you. Like that stuff you have to experience. Well, the market at your will P &L, you. yeah. yeah, and being like, holy shit, I'm up so much. I think I'm moving to Miami uh, to, you know what? Canada's <laughs> not so bad. Yeah. In, <laughs> Canada's not so bad in the winter, actually. <laughs> you go through all the emotions. No, I think that's fair. Also, if, if it seems like it, it, that we've given this a very cursory overview of main system, uh, trust me, we, we've gone to painful depths in previous videos of getting him to squiggle on the chart itself so if you just search technical roundup trade domain uh it should come up and you know we, we've given that its due diligence there um i want to ask you about the market now because i think it's at a rather interesting point in this start of the year post etf type of area um, what's, what's got your attention at the moment? I guess that's one way of phrasing it. You know, I, I know you like your high timeframes cause that sort of sets the structure for the, you know, for the trend or the draw, if you will. Uh, I know you had an ETH thesis or still might have, uh, based on ETH BTC and the sort of rotation into ETH before, before we die. Um, what have your impressions been since the ETFs went live in terms of the price action? I mean, I can kind of guess, but <laughs> um, yeah, talk us through what's, you know, what, what are your priority items when you look at the uh, medium to higher timeframes at the moment? And you can feel free to screen share or I can sort of click on timeframes, uh, whichever you think is more appropriate. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the, uh, I'll screen share here. Um, let me just close down all of my hentai tabs. <laughs> Those are the ones I sent you, right? Of course. I mean, you have the best selection. <laughs> of course. Window. Uh, why is this so freaking hard? It's a lot of tabs, eh? Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's a lot. A lot of tentacle porn. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. So I, I'm of the belief that Bitcoin has topped for a bit. Um, okay, get off, get off the show. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, we've we've had ETFs in the past. I know that this one's different. This is a spot ETF. It's so much better and it's so fantastic. But generally, these hype events that everyone you know kind of gets sucked into don't usually go the way that we want them to. Whether it's the Coinbase IPO, futures um, ETFs that we had in the past, they've usually been market tops. Um, I found it very comical um, for people who were long kind of the day of the announcement, just expecting a free ride, like to all time high or something. Um, Cause we've known about the ETF since June and we kind of were pretty confident it was going to get approved at least for the last three or so months and prices up 80% in that time period. So to me, a lot of that was, priced in 
um, the market came to an area, you know, where there is, you know, potential resistance. It took out a high, it ran into a level, um, and it's up, you know, we're up massively from, from last year. You know what I mean? Like we, we did a two X plus a three X from the lows. Um, so I, I, I kind of wasn't buying into the whole like ETF going to send us way higher. Um, I definitely thought Ethereum BTC was bottoming and I think it has. And I think this is due for a significant rally, but overall I'm still bullish on crypto, you know, for this year. I just think there's a good chance you get a buy, um, you know, sub 40 down to, you know, the low mid to low 30s uh, before an all time high. And I don't think that that's a bad thing. Um, I think just looking at the mark, the, the market on any sort of high time frame, you know, this structure looks you can take all the lines off like this looks like the most distributive type of price action we've had since you know basically last year this is how bitcoin likes to top right it likes to run above a high uh i'm gonna see it delete all these it likes to run above a high trap a bunch of people and then break down and then usually you get a retest and then it it sells off we've had on different time scales like this is the same kind of pattern here right and then breaks down obviously we're still in an uptrend if you look at how we topped here, this is very similar structurally to me um, as to where we are right now. So I, I, I think, it, in my opinion, we're probably getting a dead cat bounce right now. Like a lot of people are like, that was it. That's the bottom. I would not be surprised if this bounces up to like 44, maybe even 45, and then legs down again and absolutely torches people and takes out all of these lows. Um, that's my my thought process and i'm absolutely looking to buy um around 35 uh i think there's a great level there on the monthly right around here that seems like a no-brainer and then again there's another level you know in the low 30s here so to me dream scenario something like this play out on the monthly so we have a couple of weeks maybe months of downward price action and then we get bullish again into the halving and maybe new all-time high um you know next year at some point or sorry going uh q3 q4 i think people who are expecting us to just go to all-time high this quarter because of the etf and the other thing that i don't think any of us considered was the very silbert of it all oh, um, you clearly didn't listen to casual friday then man have you guys been talking about it I think I mentioned it once, like a few weeks before the ETF, <laughs> as like a passing note without trading yeah. the idea, but I didn't expect it to be uh, this kind of high impact, you know? I mean, he has effectively infinite sell pressure available, bit like $20 billion uh, that could be offloaded. And my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, these are people who are basically choosing to, they've been trapped in Barry's torture house for a long ass time they have a way to get out they, they are taking a hit right but you would imagine they are wanting to transfer into some other product the question is are they going to transfer into another product at this price or are they going to buy lower i think the other thing people misunderstand and you and i talked about this earlier is one dollar of inflow does not mean one dollar of buy pressure for bitcoin Right. So I, I think people might have just kind of overestimated the fact that the short term price action based on this ETF approval. But in my opinion, long term, this is kind of a consistent buy pressure for a scarce asset, probably means up and to the right over a long period of time. But uh, short term, I wouldn't be surprised to see sub 40K, 35K at all. And you think that's a good area to? buy spot for something longer because you yeah, mentioned I mean, Q3, listen, Q4. Don Alt likes 35, so I like 35. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> that's probably the best <laughs> argument you've made the whole day. Um, yeah. That's pretty reasonable uh, as far as sort of levels and stuff. Just on the flows thing, it, it, these products are complicated, you know? Uh, the, whole, the whole cash settled element, uh, the GBTC discount, the spreads between the ETF products. Uh, you can sort of go around in circles. But it reminds me of the bell curve IQ meme, 
where it's like 50 IQ is kind of just like, just look at Coinbase and then 100 IQ does all the mental gymnastics uh, about all these flows and T plus one slash two and all the settlement creation processes, so on and so forth. And then the 150 IQ is uh, back to just look at the flows. And it's just not good to see Coinbase getting hammered and trading this far below other venues. Uh, I think it'd be. Re I think there's a really good trade there once uh, that that supply abates. It's just hard with the number of days that we've had to get an idea of whether this is kind of the clips that we should be expecting and for how long. Versus, let's just get the urgent chunk out of the way, uh, and then it's easier from then onwards. Because for now, considering how hard Coinbase has been getting hammered and how much spot has been selling, this has been absorbed like decently well right <laughs> like phenomenally well yeah like compared to what we've seen in the past and what what, what you might expect uh, i mean we are down from the highs sort of 15 percent or whatever it is so it's not a trivial amount but generally speaking by bitcoin standards like this amount of spot like you know consistent spot selling has been um you know it's, it's been all right so far i don't want to speak too early because it's still relatively early depending on how those outflows go um there have also been some good interim trades that have emerged like we've seen for example on some of the market opens perps just start fucking shorting before spot even hits uh coinbase and they get squeezed and then the spot supply has kind of shifted from trickling in at the start of the session more towards the close so there's some interesting mini games going on for kind of low time frame traders but in general you know it's, it is a bit of an overhang it's hard to get a sense of you know the urgency there but i think uh, when, when that fucks off that that's that that would be very welcome uh, and realistically i mean i agree for, in the technical view if if all this urgent spot selling means that we get a material pullback to good technical levels then i guess thank you very much you know yeah um, like if you believe that we're gonna have another bull run um we want the 30 40 percent dip you want it um and this to me just it looks ripe like, I don't know how you look at this on, like, the weekly chart and just assume that this just only continues to go higher. Again, maybe I'm wrong. We've seen ugly weekly candles turn into, you know, uh, bullish moves in the past, I'm sure. Um, but it just seemed like everyone was expecting. And I know it's so hard to quantify the everyone thing. Oh, everyone was bullish. Therefore, we're going to go down. Um but yeah, I, I think a pullback is healthy. I would have loved for my second half of my tweet to play out by now uh, so I could retweet it 10 to 15 more times. Um, <laughs> yeah, but... that was that was agonizing, mate. <laughs> the first half was so dialed, um, but there's just been Bitcoin has just been so heavy. Um, yeah, let's talk about what the thesis was there. So correct me if I'm <laughs> wrong, but the argument was essentially that yes, BTC will top first. Uh, between, you know, sort of 48 and 50, I think you said, something of that nature. Yeah. Uh, but it, during that process, it's not going to nuke too hard. Uh, and instead, it'll just kind of chop or go sideways or go down a bit, whatever. And ETH will take over and we'll see ETH BTC go up and continue to go up. Uh, ETH USD, I think, was also part of the argument, right? Would yeah. go up and continue to go up. And maybe some of the ETH associated tokens, you know, your Arbitrums, your Optimisms, uh, your on-chain Ponzi's and so on and so forth, but also benefit. And then we big die. Um, my yes. problem, like Don and I spoke about this on the show several times, like the ETH rotation thing. Um, yeah. I always found it, and again, it hasn't been like fully invalidated at the moment, right? Like BTC still looks all right. The market doesn't, doesn't look like a total piece of shit. So we're still at the decision point to use cringe hedging TA Twitter language. Um, but the, the sort of hurdle that I come across at this argument is that it just relies on so much sort of bullish infinite rotation. Like we, we go from BTC just carrying the whole market. Then we go through like a whole meme coin cycle and we go through like a mid cap cycle as well. And this whole time ETH is out underperforming. And then after the news, um, miraculously, we just rotate to ETH and just everyone just keeps, make, keeps making money. And the underperforming asset... Uh, late in the rotation becomes the outperforming asset. Um, and I think also just imp more sort of precisely, I think if you want ETH to be bullish, you need to at least be neutral to bullish BTC. Because if BTC, as you mentioned, just goes down enough or is volatile enough, it's very hard to argue for like a full decoupling type outperformance from an asset that's been lagging pretty much the entire way up. So, for, like, yeah, I don't know, I the think, relative weakness is just such, it's just been such a nuisance, I think. Listen, I think the best counter arguments to the thesis are 
one you just made, there's not enough money, right, to go around. And two, um, ETH has lost its relevancy and is being taken over by something like Solana, right? And that rotation that I think everyone was waiting on to ETH, it, maybe it kind of already happened and it happened in Seoul. Uh, and there's just not enough, you know, the juice is no longer worth the squeeze. I was kind of basing it on 2021 um, where we had this massive rally here on Bitcoin, very similar type of distribution, right? We took the high, pull back, retrace. And during this retrace on Bitcoin, where Bitcoin effectively was giving you a bearish retest, Ethereum went bonkers, right? This is May 2021. Ethereum 2 x in that month where Bitcoin effectively had already topped and was giving you a bearish retest. So for Ethereum to perhaps make a fresh high here, let's say above 2,700, um, Bitcoin's going to have to trade up to 44, 45K for that thesis to still be able to play out. Perhaps one of the differences is, you know, this was the tail end of a major bull run. There's more money in the system at this point. Um, the other scenario that I kind of had mapped out was, you know, maybe this is a 2014 type of top or not 2014, sorry, 2018, 19 type of top where it's like, hey, this is actually, you know, this where we are right now. And we're going to get this big pullback, but Ethereum did not outperform here. The whole market pulled back. Um, you know, if, if you eliminate the black swan of COVID, this is kind of a relatively equivalent pullback um, on Bitcoin that we could see. So maybe that's, you know, what Mate, we're there's experiencing. There's some really memorable and traumatizing price action in that Dude. portion <laughs> like I, I know how i felt during some of those candles Dude, like, i have a tweet here because i nailed this move and then i nailed this short and then i had like a giga confidence long that was i i think it was it was like on it was like this bounce and i'm like i fucking told you like this is the fucking bottom and then this just fucking absolutely sliced through everything uh and then i mean I mean, you were on BitMEX, right? Like we were all there. We were all watching um, it at least. Yeah, good God. So that that for my thesis to still play out, I need to see a bearish retest on Bitcoin. And this relief on Bitcoin will be enough pressure off of Ethereum to allow it to pop. Maybe it's not going to go to 34, 3600. Right. But I, I damn sure hope it goes higher than 2700 because the underperformance has been embarrassing uh ansem has been insufferable deservedly so right um but uh yeah or, or like what is is ethereum done is it too expensive you know are people just not going to use it anymore i don't know I, I find that hard to believe well listen we'll be talking about the flipping in x number of months anyway we just go from one extreme to the other right yeah. like eth is dead and then eth is going to flip in uh the ansem indicator like Towards the tops, he'll be telling everyone to suck his dick. Uh, towards yeah. the bottoms, everyone's just throwing racial slurs at him completely inappropriately. Yeah. Uh, that's also yeah. his comment, not mine. He's like, yo, you always call me racial slur at the lows, and then at the highs, I'm telling all of you to suck my dick. I mean, we have some pretty creative and novel indicators uh, from Twitter. But no, I, I think that, that, that's, that makes sense. So presumably, you'd need Bitcoin to bounce like here, essentially, because yeah. we're at the daily range low of some sort at the moment no, right? I, I, I mean i have uh we're at we're at the mid-range for for uh december so right to me this is very similar uh let's just see here because i'm a trading view master i gotta this is the only way i know how to get my drawings back <laughs> there we go um this is this is just december's candle this range right and so i'm hoping that descenders mid-range here right is just um support right that's that's what we're looking at here um, uh, simple as something as simple as this, I think could be what is necessary to let Ethereum have a leg. Um, I think it wants to go. Is it um, worth it? it? I guess that's another question, right? Like, if your larger rotation thesis is lower in BTC, um, is is that relief leg from like forty two to forty five? Do you think there's enough there on the ETH catch up side to be? Uh, like, is that worth I the mean, risk, basically? I longed it this morning, and my target is just to here. Oh, 
I, like, that's very, I, that's very a, humble. That's one of those, like, it's not much, but it's honest work type of targets. Yeah, you know, it's just, it's 2.74R. The old you know? spike a root, the high, and I'll be done. It's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna pay the bills, you know? Rent will be paid, car payment's gonna be made, but, you know, this is not a new watch. The, light, the lights um, are on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the lights are on. No one's home. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I hope. I, I do think the dollar is due for a pullback. Equities are, like... Oh yeah, mate. Like, what are we t- what are we talking about here, man? Everything's all time high. Um, the the recipe is there for just one fucking <laughs> fuck you pump from Ethereum. But I've been saying that since October, right? <laughs> and it hasn't happened yet. So maybe I just need to give up. Like I've done incredibly well being long Ethereum here, but like just in terms of making money. But in terms of making money relative to what I could have made if I would have allocated to even just Bitcoin or Solana or some of these other coins, uh, I've massively, massively underperformed. Um, it reminds me of my, you know, maybe this is a thing because uh, I was bullish on LTC <laughs> last cycle. Mate, and I'm like, Don okay. is the only one who's allowed to be bullish LTC. Like that, that and, that's and his coin. <laughs> I made a 4X. Like on my investment, I bought it at like a hundred and I sold it at four hundred to the normal person. That's phenomenal. But right. Bitcoin did a twenty x. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? It's just like it, it, I don't think uh, Ethereum is on the level of LTC because it it is useful and people do use it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've been waiting on this God candle for for four or five months now, and uh, maybe it's just not going to come. Uh, but Bitcoin has to stop going down so aggressively. Uh, because it's still so much stronger um, than than Ethereum, it seems, just when the sell pressure is on. Even though Ethereum BTC looks good, if Bitcoin drops 10%, I don't see Ethereum going up. Like right. Bitcoin has to go sideways or go up for this to work out. Yeah, I mean, that's that's consistent. And anything on the altcoin front that you'll be chasing if if that starts to materialize? Or things that have yeah, been trading I mean, would, well on your watch list generally. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm long optimism, um, depressed in real life, but long <laughs> optimism <laughs> <Yeah>. virtually. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, I, I would think that the Ethereum betas, you know, do well. Like, does Pepe get a revenge pump? Oh god! Because we've had all of these meme coins that are on Solana. You've got Bonk. You've got uh what are the other fucking ones i don't even know the hat but there's with yeah right? dog with hat like there's all these you know it's like okay well what about the og meme coins the pepes uh and the sheeps or whatever so i don't know if those get a revenge pop you, your life um, is just one big catch-up trade isn't it yeah i'm just trying to say like how can i uh <laughs> make up for just not taking the easy play yeah. I, I mean listen i, I there, there's there's levels of difficulty in making money in crypto and the way that i've went about it in my opinion is the worst way like trying to literally just (laughs) leverage trade the large caps you're just doing like challenge runs the equivalent yeah i'm like hardcore mode on fucking elden ring like trying to go no no (laughs) glitchless hitless yeah and i'm getting hit a lot and i'm dying a ton (laughs) you know what i mean relatable mate yeah yeah so like there's easier ways man like I'm getting outperformed 100% by people who are farming airdrops. They're, they bought a Solana phone. They got airdrop bonk. And then they took the bonk, sold it, and bought dog with hat. You know what I mean? They're yeah. up 50 or 100x. So if you're new to crypto, um, there's so many better ways to make money than trying to trade. I'm fortunate enough that I've been here a long time where if Ethereum goes to 5K, the amount of money I make is very significant. So even though I underperform Solana or whatever, I've made a lot of money. But if you're new to this, you have like a five-figure portfolio. Like you need to be following people like Ansem and people who are actively finding the projects. And yeah, they might have a very small life cycle, but like that's the way you're going to turn a little bit of money into a lot. The days of being able to buy Bitcoin, I, I t- like people ask me this all the time, like friends, when they ask you about crypto, like, is it worth buying Bitcoin? I'm like, well, what's the best case scenario for Bitcoin? Like, it, let's assume we are going to make a new all time high. How high do you think that goes? Um, 90. And that's like, and that would be amazing. Everyone would be like, yeah. we have almost 100K. Let's say it hits 100K. Sure. So that's like a little over 5X from the lows. 
So unless you're dealing with big dollars, that's yeah, but I'm on the hundred X leverage when I'm catching that, you know? Lifting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just like, there, there's better ways to go about it. Uh, it was like DeFi last cycle, right? Like I could, I don't know about you, but I completely faded DeFi. Uh, like, in Man, I think entirety. I think I made fun of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, I mean, I made some dumb. money on like sushi. Like when they got, I, I'm just so late to this stuff. When it got listed on like Binance on perps with a bunch of chart history, then I start trading them. But at that point, I'm fucking late. Yeah, I'm trading know? the DeFi tokens. I'm not <laughs> yeah. actually using them for the. And I'm like, well, if you don't know where the yield is, the yield is you. <laughs> and then Luna happens and Anchor, and I laugh at everyone. But a lot of those people were making 20% a month for a year before well, any of that shit of it, went yeah. down. It's one of those turkey life expectancy before Thanksgiving charts, you know? Yes, exactly. So, the, yeah, I, I, I make money on hard mode, and it's it's not very fun. Um, I think there's a lot better ways to do it. And if you're willing to put in the work, um, you know, being in the telegrams, trying to find those coins that are going to move, there's so many things. Like, I, you see Yuma? Yes, UMA. Yeah. You know how many people told me to buy this, Ooh. and I'm my response instead of was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna ape." Was why, <laughs> <laughs> and apparently this is why. Is there something uh, going on? Is there like a I don't know. So I guess this is a this coin has history. It's not a new coin, but sure. the vesting ended. Right. So there's like there's been just kind of an infinite, and then apparently there was some sort of bot that was like auto shorting this thing, and it's like a it's like a TRB game oh, style, like a short squeeze. Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it just kept adding to the short, adding to the short. So I mean, there's opportunities all over the place. There's definitely ways that you can outperform um, if you just try a little bit harder. But I'm fucking old, man. <laughs> like you know what i mean yeah risk appetite like, is different you know risk appetite yeah. per portfolio size i think is also something that should be materially it changes, different changes massively yeah. and, some and strategies I'm, straight up become unavailable like you know if, if i've got whatever n amount um that i need to deploy for a trade for it to be worth it or whatever uh, and then you want to go trade illiquid stuff on chain or bitcoin nfts it's just it's just not scalable for the amount of um exposure that you need or want to make it worth it whereas if you're just starting out there is no amount uh, that isn't worth it right like everything is worth it and so you end yeah. up marrying you create this synthesis where uh, you're not your lack of size if you will as i'm very familiar with in my personal life uh becomes an advantage for a change um because you're not competing you're competing in less competitive areas you know you're trading Absolutely. with like idiots basically there's actual like, edge there yeah 100 right? percent. Like you're not like you know, lifting Wintermute's limit orders on Binance Futures, Bitcoin dollar tether perps, right? Like, what's your edge going to be there compared to on-chain with some some crackhead and it's his first yeah, cycle? Yeah, no, there, there's actual information asymmetry yeah. and, like, edge, and you can you can crush if you're willing to put in the work. I also just, there's, like, a, a certain amount of mind share that you just have, you know what I mean? And I'm someone who gets overwhelmed when I have people just peppering me with like, dude, this coin's doing this. And God forbid they say something negative. You're you're disabled yeah, uh, at that point. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm fucking frozen. You're switched off. <laughs> yeah, it's like someone has power off and I'm just fuming. Just paralyzed. Oh, I can't wait to read the comments on this one, mate. Yeah, but it's just that you have, you have a certain amount of mind share, not just like you said, asset was that you can allocate certain places. Yes. You have mind share. And well, it's like mental bandwidth, right? That's the yeah, yeah. And I can only keep up with so much. And when I have people been like, "Listen, you got to bridge to this, and then you got to buy this NFT, and then this happens, and then this happens." The amount of times I've missed out on a bag because I've done half of the process, but I didn't mint the NFT when I whitelisted it, or I bridged and then I forgot to post a link. Like Manta, I bridged some ETH over there, and then I forgot to post my link. And then Manta went live and I didn't have any fucking Manta Ray points or whatever. Like, <laughs> and then you're I'm like, what like, is my life? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I, what am I doing? And then myself? you go record a TikTok and you're like, never yeah, mind. My, no low my fiance low. is like, everything's okay. Is everything okay? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> um, and then, yeah. And then I got to retort, you know, TikToks for, for you and the editor for, uh, there's only so much you can do. It's so much you can focus on, yeah. but a rising tide lifts all boats. So I hope that you know once this correction finally finishes um we can go back to uh you know easy up only dip buying mode because this is kind of seems like maybe the first time in a very long time we're just blindly buying the dip hasn't worked um 
Yeah, also yeah. easy mode is such a convoluted term, right? Because if you look at how a lot of these things trade, unless you're very competent in low time frame trend following and good at holding through volatility that's several standard deviations higher than what it was before, then it's not easy mode. And actually, I don't think any of those things are particularly easy. It just I think we call it easy mode because it sort of feels easy in hindsight. Uh, and it feel you know the stuff actually moves, and we associate that with easy market conditions. Um, but as you and I know, like it's very hard to properly, dutifully trend follow these things, especially well, if you've got like your habits from the mean reverting market or a choppy market or a bearish market. Like starting to just like ape indiscriminately and hold stuff and scale your portfolio and keep track of things when they're moving at ten times the speed. Uh, I, I feel like because we've adopted this language of easy mode, it implicitly makes everyone who's not like turbo printing feel like shit about their trading or if they're struggling in the conditions that we've had over the past two to four months, sort of make them feel like, oh god, if I can't make money here, then I'm doomed. I just don't think that's entirely accurate or fair. Now, if I had to criticize that, I would say, well, Craig, you're just coping because you're shit at trend trading comparatively. And you make most of your better trades when the market is quiet. And I think that's reasonable. But I do also think it's reasonable that these easy mode windows, uh, they're, they're more often not a description and a product of hindsight. And when you're in the moment and everything's moving at 10 times the speed, 10 times the vol, it's not necessarily easy. It's very different. Maybe it's easy if you have a system that caters for it. But I, I don't think there's sort of free money laying on the floor necessarily in those situations and even if there is not round tripping it definitely isn't easy well, i mean look at we have we have data from the prop firm we have coins solana i think is up 3x right or 2x like a significant percentage since we launched but on the whole people have lost money on it and you kind of you you're like how and you're right. It's because just because it's going up, it does not mean you're going to long it. It's going to go up. It's going to pull back. You're going <laughs> to close. It's going to go up again. Like that is, you're right. You, you don't want to discredit. It's not easy to make money. Um, there are people who have the ability to just say, listen, I know that I'm longing something in an uptrend and I'm just going to hold it. And I know in two weeks, you know, I'm going to be up from where I bought. But the problem is, is most people who bought here are not going to hold it to here or to here. They're going to sell it here, right? And then rebuy it here and then sell it here. So, uh, you know, things can go vertical and people can still spectacularly lose money. Um, so, no, I think that's a fair point. And I do think easy mode, it's been easier too. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that the government was literally printing money and just giving it to people um, for them to ape into... <laughs> the markets with that's um, pretty easy yeah the closest thing is the basis back. trade right like when you get premiums yeah. really jacked up on perps and uh, quarterly futures and so on i guess that's a kind of easy mode trade i mean there's a borrow component um and it can get shaky if you don't manage the short leg properly um or if those <laughs> quarterlies get backwardated and like a lick spike or something but you know that that type of delta neutral ish yield farming uh, is I guess easier mode, uh, but no one does that, right? Like you, you'd think whenever that kind of free-ish or free -er money trade comes about, everyone will just trade that and come in and squash that basis. What happens instead? People see that as a risk-on signal, like oh shit, there's a ton of premium in the market. Let me just go and start buying the underlying tokens and slugging deltas, which I completely get. It's literally what I do. Um, but it's just curious how we how we sort of define these terms. Also, I have to ask: there's an active trades there on RLB. Um, is there some sort of sponsorship you're going to announce? Are you like insider trading your own RLB I contract? <laughs> I wish Razor, if you're listening, <laughs> give me a call. I've me, me and Cred want to play pachinko on stream for eight hours of Friday every Friday night. <laughs> pachinko and, Fridays, yeah. I'm sure yeah, Don will. I'm sure Don will join. He's, he's a big fan. <laughs> big pachinko guy. Um, <laughs> big aerobic guy as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and like I, I think, um, I just think the chart's going to go up. I mean, I not like i know they've they've got the burn mechanic and uh i don't see how that's not bullish i mean look you know at the I mean? chart <laughs> yeah well th this is what i mean i think there's like a mispricing here oh, like right, i'm just right. like this just doesn't you're an I arbitrage buy... now are you a fundamental investor <laughs> yeah like, i don't is buy it. this this token should only be 12 cents i think it should be worth twice as much uh and maybe i'm wrong but uh nice. either way fa uh, with maine we just won't air this episode <laughs> 
<laughs> well, um, bad news about that. Yeah. Well, unless they unless they give us the Pachinko Friday deal, <laughs> and then we'll air one every single Friday. This episode is held they... hostage until we get a Pachinko deal. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah, but no, this is. Uh, I just think this is gonna go up. This is just a spot buy, um, and uh, it, it's also been a bit uh, uncorrelated to the rest of the market. I think that's part of the UMA trade as well as, you know, I had people being like, listen, the whole market's down 20%. UMA's down 2%. Something's going on. Um, so I don't know. I just, I have a, I have an itching suspicion that this is just going to fucking go nuclear on any sort of significant balance. <laughs> Understood. But well, well good to know. That's uh, it's nice to have your watch well, list. This is either going to be up a lot or down <laughs> a lot by the time this airs and it'll be hilarious. Yeah, we can we can revisit. I mean, look, it, I, I will know how, how it goes because if I never see mention of this episode, uh, I'll assume I don't even have to look at the price chart, right? Like if, if price goes down, I'll never see or hear of this episode. Uh, God forbid there's a bounce. I'm going to see this up. You, you tweet about this episode about 10 times. I remember Non-stop. when the ETH trade happened and you sort of round tripped whatever upside leg. Uh, I literally counted the amount of tweets you put out in one day about that trade. And I think the number was either 10 or 11. Um, and it's I not DM'd. enough. It's Those <laughs> are rookie <laughs> numbers. Apparently it's not enough. I was literally messaging you like, mate, is this your first time trading? Like <laughs> how first does win. one trade evoke first so win. many emotions? I think I've just been let down by Ethereum for so long waiting for this goddamn god candle that the it's personal. When I finally felt like it was coming, I was just like, you sons of bitches, <laughs> you strangers on the internet. Who I'm going to buy a watch like- now. Yeah. You've also got yeah. more time frames and I've had hot dinners, mate. So that's... Um, I don't, how do I get rid of them? Uh, if you click the arrow at the end of the list and then you unstar oh. them. Wow. <laughs> oh, God. Is this new to you? This I literally... That is hilarious. You are so welcome. See, we learned something. Also, this well, is the part I, where you move your stop to break even, right? So you don't lose any I money. I know, I should. I should. <laughs> to be honest with you, we're you got the five bump, second. Bump. You had the five second time frame start. Is that your trade management time frame? <laughs> yeah, that, that's where I was tweeting the Ethereum trade from. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Um, okay, well, I think this has been pretty dense. I don't mean that in the British pejorative way, but rather uh, in terms of the information we tried to pack into it, or certainly you did. Um, God forbid I have something informational to say. Uh, Any final notes, comments, questions, concerns, advice, critiques, fears, doubts, suspicions? Oh, so many. Do do we have another hour? (laughs) Definitely. Um, No, I mean, listen, guys, um, always a pleasure to be on here. Um, I, I actually think you brought up a really good point about like the making people feel shitty. Um, over uh, it being easy mode and people not turbo printing. Um, I've tweeted about this probably way too many times anyways, but as usual, um, if you're making money in in this last, you know, bullish period, like consider that of W because I think what you're seeing on social media is just very much a small snapshot of people um, who seem to be turbo printing and never, you know, making any losses or anything like that. Um, but I think we're in for a good year. I genuinely do. I think the ETF overall is bullish for people. Um, so I think, uh, I think if you're getting into crypto now, or you're worried about, you know, Hey, do I have enough for the bull run? Whatever it is. Uh, I think we're going to be in for a year where there's going to be volatility. There's going to be lots of new projects getting listed. There's going to be lots of opportunities to make money. Um, so if you're looking for a time to lock in and get focused, I don't think you've missed the boat by any means. Some people will tell you like, Hey, it's too late. Like the bottoms in and you know, you, you missed it and you know, fuck you basically. Uh, I, I, I think we're gearing up for a, a good 2024, um, with the having, um, ETF long term. I think is good for crypto. So I think it's all good things, man. I think it's an exciting time to be a cryptocurrency influencer. <laughs> Yeah, put that on your LinkedIn, mate. Oh, buddy, it's already there. Along <laughs> with Breakout Prop, sign up to our website. Disgusting, you sons of bitches. vile shill. I'll do it. I'll edit that part out. <laughs> um, great. Well, thank you for coming on. It was, well, we spoke. I'll say that much. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, we probably speak more than you like these days. Yes, correct. Uh, no, no disagreement. No, it's mandatory. There. It used to be just when you could tolerate it. <laughs> It's mandatory. Uh, If you managed to make it this far through an episode of Casual Friday without Don, um, first of all, congratulations. Uh, Second of all, thank you. Third of all, remember that Maine is extremely sensitive to comments 
uh, that aren't overwhelmingly positive. And I'll let you do with that whatever you feel is appropriate. But thank you for watching this episode of Casual Friday. Duck should be back next week. Uh, leave a like on the video. Um, thank you to Wu for supporting the show. Their links are also available in the description below. Have a wonderful weekend. It's my birthday this weekend, so I will be online on Twitter the entire time. Might, might have a sad cupcake at my desk while watching some anime. So if you want to tweet at me, feel free. Um, thank you very much, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.